My name is Mark Silberg. I'm Governor Polis's uh, advisor on climate and energy in Colorado, and you are in the discussion on state policy. Uh, and if you're not in the right room, you're welcome to leave, but uh, I think this is the best panel happening at the moment. So, so a little bit of context setting. Uh, in my view, and I think my panelists will agree, this is the absolute best time in human history to be working on clean energy and climate policy, particularly at the state level, though also at the federal level. Between the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act, Chips and Science Act, we're seeing three times more federal dollars invested in state climate action and clean energy in the next five years than the previous 30 combined. In fact, threefold more than the previous 30 years combined. Um, initial analysis suggests that the Inflation Reduction Act alone will reduce the cost of some of our most important clean energy technologies of the future, electric vehicles, heat pumps, grid scale battery storage, green hydrogen, carbon management and carbon capture, direct air capture technologies, and sustainable aviation fuels by about 40% by the end of the decade, which for many of our states fundamentally transforms the economics of these technologies. And in many cases means that the challenges that lie ahead for us in terms of implementation and deployment are more around, do we have enough people to do this work? Do people know these incentives, rebates, and project financing opportunities are available to them? And uh, do we really have the right policy landscapes in states to deploy these technologies at scale? In the case of Colorado, our initial estimate suggests that in 2030, compared to a world in which IRA, CHIPS, and the inflation reduction or the IIJA do not happen, we're gonna have 20% more light duty EVs on the road, a seven-fold increase in the deployment of heavy duty electric vehicles. We will triple heat pump deployment and lead to 50% more wind and solar capacity on an already 80% renewable grid in 2030 in Colorado. And I think each of our states can agree that the time is ripe for us to get these investments rolling. So with that, um, I'm going to stop talking and hand it off to our distinguished panel. I'd like each of you to introduce yourselves, tell us what state you're from, and give us a little bit of flavor for how your state is seizing the moment that we have here with these federal dollars. David. Well, good afternoon. Thanks uh, for everyone joining, and, and good to be here. I'm David Hochschild. I chair the California Energy Commission. Uh, and uh, Thunder's Agreement, to your point, it is the most exciting time, uh, certainly in my 23-year career in clean energy uh, with what's happening right now. So to give you a little sense in California, um, the future is flowing through the electric grid, principally. We're at 60% carbon-free electricity now, uh, en route to 90% by 2035 and 100% by 2045. And what you're seeing is the reach of this clean electricity is expanding very rapidly. We're adding about 1,000 electric vehicles a day in California. We're adding huge amounts of energy storage from 250 megawatts in 2019 to 5,000 megawatts today. Uh, and we're also electrifying the building sector. And um, as we decarbonize as well, um, we're, there's a big focus on prioritizing equity uh, and really trying to lift up the communities that have been hardest hit uh, from pollution uh, over the years. Um, one point I would make, um, just by way of framing, is that throughout California's journey to a clean energy future, there have been uh, there's been a lot of mythology propagated that this stuff is bad for the economy. And you know, we've been hearing this for 10, 15 years. So in 2015, as we're de decarbonizing, we surpassed Brazil to be the number seven uh, economy in the world. Then France to be number six. In 2018, we surpassed the UK. Uh, to be number five, and then this year we're going to pass Germany to be the fourth largest economy in the world. And I think it is worth noting that decarbonizing is actually good for the economy. We've attracted a lot of investment. You know, we we have 43 companies making electric vehicles uh, in the state of California today, um, and uh, Tesla, the Tesla factory in Fremont, is now the most productive car factory in all of North North America. Uh, we're going to be doing offshore wind, 25 gigawatts of offshore wind coming to the state. So uh, it's a period of great dynamism. And I just wanted to say, you know, we're all from different states, but we're all on the same team, uh, kind of rooting for each other uh, and and uh, supporting each other in, in, as we build a clean energy future together. Are we just going down the line here? We will, although, Brandon, we're going to skip over you and come back to you. So go ahead, Jane, and then the representative. Sorry about that. That's a little awkward, but we are We're all, all working together. Me, so. <laughs> um, my name is Jane Cohen. I lead 
Governor Murphy of New Jersey, his climate office. And I just want to echo, you know, what's been said already about this being just really a a very important and very different time in the climate world. And I want to say it's not just these big federal investments, which, of course, are enormous, but really with the Biden administration coming into office, that's really where we began to see the change. And for those of us who have been working in state government, um, you know, in a previous administration, I have to say that it really did. it, It was challenging in many ways, and it really has been a huge difference with the Biden team on board. And then obviously with the federal investments, it's just it's just a game changer. Um, I would say in terms of um, sort of New Jersey and and what we're looking to do, we had, you know, big goals on climate before the federal investments came in. And I'm sure, you know, all my states here had those as well. But the difference is that now this funding really unlocks the pathway to actually seeing those goals come to fruition. And that's what's really, really exciting. We we know what the goals have to be. And before we had the resources that now we have through these federal packages, you know, we really did try to understand, you know, how are we going to get there? How are we going to put together different different existing federal funding, state funding? How are we going to leverage partnerships with the private sector? But it was very challenging and it really did stall out quite a bit of our action. And now we really do see the pathway to to you know, really both deploying our renewable energy at scale, ensuring that our grid is going to be able to handle it, um, and working on um, many of our adaptation projects that are also extremely important. So we feel this is a really, really exciting moment. Um, I would also just echo the point on developing um, real economic growth from this. I mean, you know, I know we're partnering, but we are actually. Um, in competition with California for being the fourth biggest economy. Um, you know, New Jersey, we're almost there, but, but not quite. Um, but we do really see the synergy between developing our green economy um, and making sure that we have a uh, robust climate future and seeing huge advances in economic growth and in bringing a more diverse workforce into this new area. So and for all those reasons, it's a very exciting time. Um, and I'm looking forward to talking more about that with my colleagues. Good morning, afternoon, right? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. My watch is dead. Um, Cam Buckner, Illinois State Representative, Assistant Majority Leader, um, and had the prev- the privilege uh, to um, lead negotiations in the state of Illinois on the Climate Equity Jobs Act, which we passed uh, last year when Governor Prisker uh, decided that Illinois needed to be a leader on climate. Uh, he sat down with me and talked about what the vision was. Uh, and when I look at the work that um, has been done in Jersey and California and Colorado and across the country. It really was an opportunity for us in Illinois uh, to shift the paradigm, right? We are a state that 10 years ago had four dozen coal power plants throughout the state. Um, when it came to renewables like solar and wind, uh, we were at about 2% um, when you look at our overall portfolio, right? And so uh, this for us was really an opportunity to do things differently. Um, And we baked in the things that we saw in California when it comes to uh, making sure that um, uh, the economic conversation uh, was at the forefront. But we also saw this as a chance to create some true equity uh, across the the state of Illinois. And the way we looked at it was that, uh, you know, our working class families in the state could not be left out of the clean energy revolution. Uh, And so we were very intentional and very specific in those spaces to do that and find ways to um, to you know, support our nuclear fleet to make sure that we have 40% renewables uh, by the year 2030, 50% by 2040, and 100% by the year 2050. And this is important, especially uh, you know when we, we talk about collaboration and the uh, examples that we can get from other places. When, when we when you see a state like California, which has you know a thousand miles of coastline um, and uh, agricultural valleys and large cities dealing with energy grid issues. Um, and uh, the intentional fortitude to try to make that work and find a way to move the state forward uh, for a state like Illinois, much smaller, but with many of the same geographical and regional kind of variances within the state, it was important for us to be able to um, dig into all of that as well. And so um, this is uh, obviously a just the first step in, in the right direction as far as I'm concerned, but uh, the collaboration is key. 
and we have this is our state panel and we have a perch and representation from Mr. Brandon from Boundary Stone Partners who brings a legacy experience uh, in the federal side both in the federal government and in the private sector. And so Brandon, I were hope, I'm hoping you could share with us from your vantage point, a bit of perspective on, we talk sometimes about the laboratories of democracy in the states and states inspiring and leading by example, and that the policies that are incubated in the states flowing up to the federal level, but also now we have this national framework flowing back down to the states. Could you share a little bit with us about how you think about that dynamic and some examples from your experience? Sure, thanks Mark. Uh, just for background, I worked in the Obama administration, was in the White House the first year working on climate, and then went to the Department of Energy, uh, was chief of staff there during a very historic time. We had the Recovery Act, so I'm very familiar with how these funds flow. I uh, was also there for uh, Hurricane Sandy, Fukushima, and the BP oil spill. So a lot happened there. That's where all the gray hairs came from. Um, just to give you a sense of how big this is, um, when the United States wants to go all in on something, we create an industrial policy. So the first example of that, or most famous, is World War II. Uh, when the war started, we did not have the arsenal uh, to win that war. So the U.S. government paid private companies to make the products that we needed to win the war. The ships, the tanks, the planes. Um, when we were in the Cold War with the Soviet Union and we wanted to win the space race and the Russians got ahead of us with Sputnik. We went all in with industrial policy, with a vision from President Kennedy to get uh, a man on the moon. Uh, so significant government partnerships there. This is what's happened in the last two years. Uh, the U.S. government realized that China was winning. Uh, and so President Biden decided uh, with the Congress uh, to create this industrial policy where we are paying private companies to make these products then we're paying consumers to buy them. So that's the really big edge here. When I was in the Obama administration and we had the Recovery Act, you know, an example was 48C. It was a nice tax credit. It was a one-time uh, credit if you were to build a factory to make uh, you know, uh, clean energy product. But now these companies that are making solar panels or making batteries or inverters or extracting critical minerals that we're gonna need for those products are gonna be paid per product to make them. So that's the big difference. But a lot of this is gonna flow through the states. A lot of the money will go to the states in grants because they want to move that faster. Um, because everyone understands we have a shot clock here where we have to make enormous progress before 2030. So the idea is get a lot of that money to the state so it can move faster. Um, and there's gonna be a lot of these decisions are made at the state and local level. Things like permitting, which is a big choke point for getting these projects built. Nobody's worried about, are we gonna build renewable energy pro products? I mean, the, the costs were already there, cost parity. And now with these policies, it just incentivizes people to go faster. But so many decisions made by public utilities commissions and other state entities uh, are gonna be a big factor in whether we beat the shot clock or not. So I'm really interested to hear from our panel how we're gonna do that together. And I live in California. I'll never leave, but I'm most proud of being from Chicago. Like I can. And to that point, Representative Buckner, you mentioned the Clean Energy Jobs Act, and it doesn't seem like any coincidence that your landmark clean energy policy in Illinois includes jobs, and so too does the IIJA at the federal level. Could you elaborate a bit more for our audience about your experience building the stakeholder coalitions, building the political will? What did it take to get that legislation through? And how did that frame around jobs impact the success of the legislation? Yeah, collaboration, 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 right? Those, those uh, that really was the, the ethos of how we were able to, to move this forward. And, and one thing I didn't say in the beginning that I think is worth noting um, is that when Illinois passed our clean energy, clean, sorry, climate equity jobs act, it changed five times over the last year. So, um, uh, we were going through a ethical scandal with our largest utility, Commonwealth Edison, right? And so uh, a part of this was uh, bound to be reactionary to what had happened. Um, and so we did some things like changing the fact that there are no more formula rate hikes in, in Illinois, um, uh, making uh, uh, the, the utility more accessible and whatnot. But what the governor implored us was that listen this cannot be just a utility bill 
right? It has to be a bill about the climate and about jobs, and once again, how to make sure that the climate revolution does not leave working class Illinoisans out of um, out of the equation. And so when we look at what happened in Washington, right, with the Infrastructure uh, Act, there are some very clear parallels there. Um, the first version of that bill was a $700 billion bill that was about roads and bridges and highways. Um, and then Congress sunk, sunk their teeth into it um, and came back with a bill that was $500 million billion more, so a $1.2 trillion bill uh, that dealt with the uh, electric grid, which dealt with clean water, which dealt with broadband, right? Um, and so often when you create these huge pieces of legislation, you got to make sure that all these folks are at the table to, to, to have a say-so. And so for us, um, the hardest thing during these negotiations was finding a way uh, to make sure that those of us on uh, the, the climate um, and, and energy justice side of it and environmental justice side of it uh, could align with the labor unions who employed the folks who worked at the coal plants, um, who could align with uh, folks who were doing reliability and resilience work around the state. Right in 2019, we saw uh, some of the uh, most horrific weather events in Illinois that we had ever seen. As um, as Governor Newsom would say, the highs got hotter and the colds got colder and the wets got wetter, right? Um, and so we had to be able to respond to that, but it, it, w it was about intentionally bringing everybody to the table, having some real conversations about we move the, the legislation forward. And I'll be honest with you, the, the bill died 10 times um, because of that. But once we got to the final product, it was one that everybody could work with. Can I ask him a follow-up? Absolutely. Because um, you're sort of brushing over the fact that you managed to, to get everyone to a place where there was agreement. And I think in New Jersey, I'm seeing this, and I know in a lot of states that the environmental justice coalitions and labor unions, that it's very difficult to find that place of alignment. Um, and so I just think it would be helpful if you could talk a little bit more about actually what that really looked like. Yeah. Um, it was messy. It was messy. It was ugly. It was nasty uh, because there were folks who were willing to say, if we can't get what we want out of this, we're leaving um, the, the, the negotiating table. Um, and uh, we have very slim margins by which this passed. And in fact, there are only two Republican legislators that voted for it. Um, and, and they were people who were really um, caught the brunt of the pushback from their colleagues. Their constituents wanted it. Um, which is why they were able to do it, and they were able to get reelected right afterwards, right? Um, but uh, it it was um, it was a, a sobering exercise because people were willing to say, especially with the the comment stuff in the background, people were really ready to walk away from the table and give us nothing. Um, but uh, I think the way that we finally got there was that we began to educate the populace in Illinois on why this was important. On, on how we could not go back to business as usual and that we needed, you know, whether you are a farmer in Crawfordsville, Illinois, or whether you are um, a single mother on the south side of Chicago, why this was important to you. And so I would say uh, the, the biggest champion in this space for me uh, was the Illinois Environmental Council and some of those groups who did this outside work that we couldn't do as legislators uh, and that the governor wasn't really able to do to educate people on the importance of this. Uh, and that pushback came back to legislators and uh, we saw a change in the, in the tide, absolutely. And it's absolutely true that the climate narrative has become more intersectional talking about job creation, talking about public health, talking about air pollution, how all these things come together to advance a more equitable society. Jane, you've done a lot of work both prior to your time with the governor's office and in your role now. Could Drop you... on the mic, Jane, I like it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing else to say. I'm curious, Jane, how, how you're all thinking about the intersection. First time I've seen a mic drop before she speaks. That's good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's how, that's that's how, how powerful she is. She is. Yeah. That's confidence for you right there. Ladies, take note. Um, well, I think, and, and this goes to, to the point that um, a representative was saying, I mean, these issues are, I mean, they're not just intersectional, really. They're just very, very interrelated. Um, so my, I spent many years working um, on human rights issues and a lot of human rights uh, issues related to climate and environment. And I mean, what you see is whether you're looking at issues abroad or you're looking here at home, I mean, the issues are very, very similar. And I, I think it's helpful for us because 
things get siloed so easily and this is you know it's, it's a very hard problem to solve how you think about how you can really address things in a much more holistic way but here even at this conference i mean we're talking about climate 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 and issues about equity um issues around poverty you know all that's kind of on the edges but actually it's really central to this discussion both in the united states and abroad um and and the more we can think about these as really sort of one major issue that has all these different tentacles, I think the more we can come up with holistic solutions. So just an example, uh, when we talk about building electrification, so obviously buildings in New Jersey, a huge part of our emissions pie, we absolutely have to you know, get a hold of reducing emissions in the sector. And we're gonna do that by electrifying our buildings. But when we do that, we also really need to be thinking about what are the health triggers in these buildings? Is it lead? Is it, are there asthma triggers? Are folks not able to pay their bills? Um, are they living you know, near a power plant? And really think about solving for this in a much more holistic way. And it's really challenging. It is really, so a lesson I've learned over my career is that it's very hard to fix things. I mean, I know that's, I hope that's not too much of like a negative message, but it's it's just the reality. It's really hard to fix things. You think, okay, I come into this position, kind of see these issues. You know, if we could just integrate and braid these programs together, you know, it would really, you know, solve all this. And then you get there and it's, it's just very, and maybe you can tell us from your time in the Obama administration why it's so hard to get the federal programs to braid, but it is just very challenging. Um, but I think it's something that if we really want to move the needle, not just on you know decarbonizing X, but really seeing those um, and really you know equity moving in, in where we need it to be, we're gonna have to think about taking apart some of these structures and really thinking, you know, how can we rebuild? And I think the IRA is actually a really good opportunity to do that and to make those priorities really public and out there of what state governments want, what the federal government wants in these in these different areas. And what I find being in state government, coming from a more activist background and coming from a human rights background, is that that while there's a lot of I think. Uh, alignment on that, I have a little bit of a unique perspective on it. Now, can I can I drop my mic again? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so speaking about lessons learned and uh, learnings from the past and trying to fix institutions that sometimes move more slowly than all of us would like, David, you've been in, in state government for a fair amount of time. California is soon to be the fourth largest economy in the world, and that means you all have been able to provide a tremendous amount of leadership, both in the U.S. and internationally pulling demand for some of these clean energy solutions, building the enabling policy environment and regulations for other states to follow. Um, lots of optimism around California, but what have been some of those roadblocks or failures in your career? And can you share a little bit with the audience what happened and, and how to think and learn from those experiences? Yeah, happy to. But first, Representative, I just want to say congratulations. I think we should give you a round of applause. That is a, that is a we know how tough Illinois politics are, and, and uh, I do think the number one human quality that we need to persevere is just relentlessness. Yeah. Like, never get it, because every big win, certainly in my career, it's always preceded by one, two, three, it sounds like in your case, it's 10, 10 times uh, failing before you pass, and I think that's a really good lesson for us all to take. I'll get to your question. I want to just first say, I think a really good lens to understand where we are is the story of smoking in America because I think it's very analogous to climate. So both my grandfathers were in World War II. Every American soldier got in their daily rations a pack of cigarettes, and you had a generation of American men come home from World War II as smoke. Half the country smoked after World War II. Then the science came out, hey, smoking causes cancer, and secondhand smoke causes cancer, and the response of the tobacco industry in the United States was to go from manufacturing one product cigarettes to manufacturing two products. They made cigarettes and they manufactured doubt. They put $100 million into junk science to come up with other possible explanations of why everyone who smoked was getting cancer. And that had the effect of delaying, but not ultimately stopping the public understanding that you're talking about that helped lead to um, progress. And now uh, we have all these policies to reduce smoking, warning labels, banning, you know, 
cigarettes in, in restaurants and airplanes and so forth. And we went from half the country smoking. We're down to 12 percent falling. Right. And so I do think that's the way to understand where we are with climate and clean energy and and fossil fuels uh, in California. We've been going at this for a while. I think the number one lesson that we've learned, because we also made a lot of failures along the way, was don't do short term policies. Our early programs for solar, for wind, they, they were rebates to be around for a year, and then we run out of money. You cannot build an industry like that. So now everything we're doing, particularly in the electric sector, but also with electric vehicles, are all long term targets, and they provide stability and certainty. And that unlocks investments. And because of that strategy, you know, our state has been the incubator for the clean energy industry. The first utility scale wind projects in the world were installed in California. Utility scale solar started in California. Uh, you know, obviously electric vehicles and, and even energy codes and standards. But that's been the main lesson. You have to have a long term framework. And when you do that, it really invites new industries to start. And investors like Brandon can can actually feel comfortable making long-term plays because some of what's needed are long-term bets, Absolutely. you know? And so I think to me, that's also why what happened with the Biden administration passing the, the Inflation Reduction Act this summer, which I think is the most consequential piece of legislation, you know, maybe in my lifetime because of the transformative effect it's going to have on the energy and automotive sectors. But Provide, we've never had 10-year tax credits for solar, for wind, for electric vehicles, electric heat pumps, energy storage, geothermal. These are transformational, but only because they're long-term, um, which, by the way, is what the fossil fuel industry had. We've had the oil depletion allowance tax credit has been in place since 1926. Okay, That's a fully mature industry. They don't need those anymore, but we haven't had that for clean energy. So this is a super exciting moment. I think the combination of state leadership coupled with what the president and Congress just did, you know, we are witnessing a sea change. And just one example, last quarter, Q4 in California, we hit 23% of new vehicle sales being electric. Okay. A year ago, it was 12%. Okay. We are going to soon break 50% and then we're going to, by 2035, you know, get to hundred percent and it'll be just like, you know, it was for cell phones early on, like nobody had them and people were skeptical and now they're ubiquitous. I mean, that's what is happening with clean energy. So clearly with 10 years of tax credits, we've solved the problem and there won't be any challenges with implementation at all is what I'm hearing. Maybe to that point, curious from anyone on the panel, what are going to be those roadblocks? What is missing in our policy landscape? Well, first, I, I wanted to talk about the, the smoking analogy. I think that's like really uh, a good one, David. Um, who here would like to know what the air quality is on the block where they live or they go to school or where they work? All right, everybody can agree on that. And so we got Davida here, who is founder of this amazing company that they drive around in EVs with mobile sensors and they can detect exactly what level of air quality you have on your block. And so David, so, you know, we could point out to the science of smoking. Now we can really see the harms that the fossil fuel companies have done to you know local communities, and we know where that has all been. It's people who have suffered first and worse from that, and then that can help drive where the investments go. So if you're a local government and you want to live up to these Justice 40 standards, and you're thinking about, okay, we get this money from the federal government, where do we start? Where do we go? You can micro-target those investments based on science that innovative companies uh, like DeVita are building out there. So I'm seeing like incredible opportunity for ways that the federal government and the states can work together, use data that we didn't have before to really target where that money should go first and worst, or first and uh, at the beginning. And how will we mess it up? Any thoughts? Well, <laughs> there's a lot of bureaucracy. Um, and I'm really interested in what some of our local uh, public servants here think about some of the permitting uh, and other staffing issues. I know at the, at the DOE, um, when I was there, uh, we started the loan program. Um, I mean, it existed right before we got there, but it really got funded under the Recovery Act. And so, um, you know, we funded the first six utility scale solar projects um, ever because the banks wouldn't do them because it was a new technology. After it was proven, the banks would come in and nobody ever had to go to the government again to get financing to build a renewable energy project. 
But standing up that office was hard. Um, and so now at the DOE, they have really reorganized the department around deployment, which is exciting. Uh, so you've got this whole new vertical where you've got the Office of Clean Energy Demonstrations, which has tens of billions of dollars. So if you want to put together a demonstration project, it's hard for like venture capital investors to do that. That's how clean tech 1.0 really struggled was because it's a very capital intensive industry. So now you can go to the government and get money to go build your first demonstration you know, project. But standing that program up and moving that money is difficult. So um, getting it over to the states, you know, it's, it's going to be really um, a challenge. So I'm interested to hear what our local public servants are going to do about it. I would just say, first of all, that was good. You can drop the mic, Brendan. Uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was just going to build on that real quick, which is I do think, first of all, there's nothing about the challenges that we face right now that's outside the realm of a solvable problem. Everything is solvable. I think one of the top issues for us has to do with utility interconnections, because we are being stretched. I mean, climate change is making it harder to fight climate change. We're having to respond to so many issues around wildfire mitigation. You know, that's taking utility service time to deal with, and then slowing down, you know, installation of EV chargers, energy storage, that kind of thing. So. We're, but we have to do this. We have to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time and just scaling that up. I think also on the government side, you know, DOE has $100 billion to get out the door. Their staff size is basically the same when you were there. Yes. And, you know, bringing talent in to scale it up, it, just getting through the federal hiring process is a real challenge. I mean, there's some heroes working there, but um, you need reinforcements, definitely. For sure. Yeah. There's a lot of talent. You know, if you're interested in being a public servant, you should go. It's a wonderful experience. I just I'll add this because I'm I'm really chewing on the question about um, how we're going to mess it up and and you know how do we avoid roadblocks? Said a different way as well. Um, and I know that we we were very intentional about this in Illinois. Uh, we saw what pushbacks we would get when it came to implementation and the what's next thing, uh, and so we put for some very stringent reporting mechanisms. Um, you know, there's gonna be a lot that the General Assembly has to do, that the governor's office has to, has to do, that IEPA has to do, in order to um, prove to people that what we said two years ago wasn't a lie, right? I mean, even those who completely believe in, in science and believe in what we were talking about, uh, we're, we're Illinois, but they're acting like they're from Missouri. They got, we gotta show them, right? We gotta, we gotta show them that, um, that this was worthwhile, that the juice was worth the squeeze. And uh, for, for, for us, I think that is the, that's the way forward. Uh, and just to contextualize this for, for, for the room here, uh, I just finished working also on Illinois' ban on assault weapons, which was easier than closing down coal plants. We had less people protesting the Capitol. Um, and, and at the behest of the NRA, people did come down to Springfield to talk about this, but it, it was a much easier lift to ban assault weapons across the state. And we've got four assault weapon manufacturers downstate Illinois as well, just to put it in context. Um, so that tells you what we're fighting against um, and why uh, I think intentionality has to be the way forward so people can actually buy in. That's a very scary thought, actually. Um, so I would say there's sort of four things that, that I want to raise. So the first, um, off of Brandon's point around capacity. So DOE has a capa staff capacity problem, but so do the states. Um, this is just a huge amount of money for the states to um, deploy. It requires a lot of times new programs and states you know, don't have the capacity necessarily to really be able to leverage that in the most effective way. Um, so I think that's sort of the first thing. The second thing is workforce more generally. You know, the we are going to need a very well-trained workforce in order to really implement and deliver all the money that's coming through. And some of those jobs take a lot longer to train for than others. And so understanding what that runway is, ensuring that we have the training programs and then that we have folks who can really do those jobs is very, very important. And I think 
New Jersey and all other states are really thinking about this, but are aware that this could be a place where uh, we fall down on the job. I would say the third is on equity, again, and Justice 40. I mean, Justice 40 is is great conceptually, but really implementing it is challenging. And in New Jersey, we don't have a great way to uh, to make sure there's accountability there. Um, and I, I, I worry a lot about taking this opportunity and not having the intentionality around the equity piece, not growing a more diverse workforce, and not really leveraging the opportunity that we have to spur economic development for for everyone in New Jersey specifically. Um, but the fourth piece, and I think this goes to the representative's point, is really communication. I think we have to kind of the large, big tented we really think about how we communicate on climate. Um, it, it still is in some ways a niche issue for people because they think of it as an electric car or, you know, a, a fancy thing in your home that you, you know, why are you doing that? Um, we have not done a great job of really mainstreaming this in a way that everybody can understand and everyone can understand the urgency. And it's, it's actually quite difficult it's easy to communicate on the one hand. It's difficult to communicate on the other. And, and I find in New Jersey, a lot of times people will say, you know, I, this is not my highest priority. Like I'm trying to feed my kids or I need to, you know, I'm looking for a job, like trying to deal with, you know, the air quality issue is very important. People understand that mostly through, you know, children having asthma, but it, it, it can feel like a secondary concern. And I think that's where a lot of times on the on the opposite side, where like the Koch brothers have done an amazing job, you know, on on the kind of pro fossil, you know, that's an easier message. So it's just something to kind of put out there, especially for the youth in the audience, that I think there's a real need and an opportunity to change the narrative. And we absolutely have to do it if we're going to if we are going to really move the needle. So in a couple minutes, we're going to turn it over to questions. Um, but before we do, we have an audience here of fabulous, amazing people from civil society, the research community, the business community. Could each of our panelists just share, given that we do have these capacity constraints at the federal level and at the state level, what is the role for our audience in helping support the development of these programs and the implementation of these policies? I'll start. Um, I... Um you look at the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of the incentives are targeted towards uh, disadvantaged communities. So if you want to deploy a heat pump into a building, a developer like Block Power, if you all don't know Donnell and what they're doing over there, it's really fascinating. They're trying to electrify buildings. If you want to deploy a heat pump into a building, with the IRA, you're highly incentivized to go to a disadvantaged community first because the rebate is basically the equivalent of a free heat pump. So the, the developer will make more profit. It's, it doesn't even have to be out of altruism. If you want to deploy a heat pump, the company will make more, more money deploying it into a disadvantaged community. But how these developers and these clean tech companies work with those communities is not smooth they don't there's not trust they don't know how to talk to each other so i think for this audience this is something i've been thinking about and would love to work with any of you on is like how do we bring those companies that are deploying these clean tech you know products into disadvantaged communities where there's trust and there's like mutual wins uh because it's set up that way but i don't know we need to make sure we take advantage of that if we're um and that I think what Brandon said makes a whole lot of sense. If we are, um, you know, conjuring up Louis Brandeis's laboratories of democracy, which I think we've seen in, in, in many states, as we said earlier, um, those laboratories only work if we have clinicians, right? And those are the folks in this room, the people who are doing this work on a normal basis. Uh, and we also can't let uh, state lines uh, geographical boundaries uh, really s stop us from uh, connecting, uh, communicating, and finding a way to yes instead of getting stuck at no in these spaces. Uh, it is so important that we not be siloed and that we create some real interconnectedness uh, to make these things work. I would just add, I think collectively we have got to create more pipelines for top talent 
to come into public service right now because none of the change that we're talking about happens without effective governance. It's not enough. I mean, just the process of getting interconnected to the utility grid, what you have to go through, interconnection studies and permitting and so on, requires good governance. You know, rate making, these things are super complex. You look at where we can get kind of wrapped around the axle, and a lot of it is basically problem solving in government. And so I, I think, you know, that's just one really for the academic institutions in the room. You know, I just think um, having things like internships and fellowships, we've started one with. Stanford getting, you know, 15 grad students to come, you know, every summer and then many of those people end up taking jobs. That's been really helpful, but we need to supercharge that. I just think right now for climate having, you know, top-notch talent come in to government agencies at the state and federal level has never been more important. Yeah, I would agree with what everyone said here. I would just amend a little bit that last comment and say you know, top notch talent can come from anywhere. Um, and so making sure that there are those pathways, whether it's a top university or a community college or a VOTEC, which is a place I think we all see there's, you know, a lot of value and investment there. Um, making sure that those pathways are available to a broad array of folks who bring diverse perspectives and, and all talent across the board is really critical. All right, over to you. Do we have microphones in the room? Let's start in the back there and we'll work our way around. You, sir, with the glasses. Well, first of all, I'm not sure I agree with that premise. I mean, the largest IPO this year is a solar tracker company, Next Tracker, um, and there's a ton more innovation. I mean, Brandon, you might hit some of the <laughs> things we were just talking about at lunch. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know better than anybody, Michael, that the total cost of ownership of many of these zero emission vehicles is lower than existing, you know, internal combustion engines. So um, we are at cost parity with a lot of these technologies, which is really exciting. Heat pumps, they're better you know, technology than your existing HVAC. Uh, the incentives are there to get us going faster. Um, and you know, the good news with some of the policies is in order to get around the uh, filibuster, you know, they had to do these policies, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act through uh, reconciliation, which is this like DC jargon for, um, you know, they had to really do it through tax policy. And so a lot of these um, incentives are through tax credits, or is not discretion. If you buy the product or you build the product, you get the tax credit. Uh, and as David mentioned, giving investors that certainty, because a lot of the investors, you know, I live in both these worlds, you know, coming from government service investors are traditionally like more libertarian they're just scared of government they're like that's risk i don't know what's going to happen i don't know what they're going to do and for a long time with some of these renewable energy tax credits they were right because we would lurch from year to year and there's always this uncertainty am i going to get the credit or not and so investors do not like uncertainty and so now with this 10 years uh, of certainty around a lot of these credits investors are feeling you know more confident about it and since it was already you know at price parity or close and those credits can make the difference and they know they have certainty around it i'm seeing a lot of capital flowing into climate i'm seeing other countries who never looked at the U.S. market are now saying, I want to be here. I want to build here. I want to invest my money here. So I'm more optimistic than ever uh, about our chances on climate because uh, we've gotten serious between the U.S. government and what everyone's doing in the states, too, around this. So uh, I'm seeing a, a, a lot of reasons for optimism. Who's next? Mike Runner, you make your choices. Hi, uh, thank you all for being with us today. Uh, my name is Amelia Smith. I work at an urban resilience nonprofit called Resilient Cities Catalyst. 
And in a lot of our work, I think we're seeing that in order to actually execute on these promises, cross-sectoral collaboration is so critical. And I think we talked a lot about capacity concerns at the local and state government, but obviously that is even more of a challenge in a lot of like our nonprofit sectors as we think about collaborating with communities to actually uh, fully execute against Justice 40 commitments. And so I'm wondering just as your states are approaching this, how you're thinking about ways that this funding could actually support capacitating those organizations or if you've seen it done uh, successfully previously. I can give one example um, that I think I think is a good model. We're happy with it so far, which is, so we have a big vision in California called Lithium Valley. So basically like Silicon Valley for lithium. We have the largest geothermal brine lithium resource in the world. Current global market's about 400,000 tons for lithium. This site in Southern California can produce 600,000 tons. And it's a very, very green process, very low energy use, um, powered by 100% geothermal. But um, this is a community, it's very low income, where it's located, big air quality issues, I think pretty significant distrust of not just state government, but also local government. So one of the things we did was we created a, a Lithium Valley Commission, 14 members representing everybody from Native American tribes to labor to local community groups to develop recommendations and really be involved in, you know, from start to finish how the lithium industry would develop. And um, that was a very intensive, exhaustive process, but it resulted, you know, this past summer in the passage in the legislature of a lithium tax. All, so there for every ton of lithium produced, there's revenue that's going to go to meet local priorities, schools and bridges and roads and so forth. And I think it's a good, it's a good model. And I think for the lithium developers, I actually think it's benefited them to be able to communicate to the public, hey, here's the actual concrete benefits that stay in this community. Um, and, you know, that was a, I don't want to say that was an easy process, but um, it's exactly the kind of hard work of, you know, bringing people together that I do think is a, is a template. And if I may just add on, in Colorado in 2019, we signed an Environmental Justice Act, which I think really, um, at the time, recognized the exact challenge you're describing, which is that there's really good community-based organizations doing citizen science and doing organizing work and getting the word out about programs and educating the public. And so within the last six months, I think, our Environmental Justice Advisory Board has actually launched a public grant program for any of those purposes and others. And so the state is actually participating in supporting community-based organizations and smaller nonprofits in doing that work on the ground. Um, I'm very excited to see what awards are made because I think then we can think about what is working in one community and how to scale that across the state and hopefully in many other places. So definitely something to take a look at. I had one thing and I, I gotta run after this too, so I gotta catch a flight back to Abraham Lincoln's hometown. Um, so that, thank you for the question. I, I, this was a real struggle for us um, in the legislation that we passed in Springfield. To me, it was extremely important that we did it. It did not make it into the final um, legislation, but there is now current legislation um, that hopefully will be passed this session, which ends in May, um, that uh, will directly make sure that there is a link between the community organizations and the um, uh, the folks who are doing the work on the ground and providing resources and a platform for them as well. Uh, we'll also use that uh, if I if we get our way uh, as a carrot in many ways to. Um, to force some of the larger municipalities in Illinois to start taking this work more seriously. Um, Chicago does not currently have a Department of the Environment. Um, we had one under a previous mayor and it went, it went away. We haven't had one in almost a decade now. Uh, and so um, many of us who represent the city uh, and larger cities within the legislature are gonna also use this as, as a way to, to entice and push municipalities to take this seriously and to work with states, but by doing that, work with organizations like you all who are, um, once again, actually doing the work on the ground. Representative, thank you for being here. If we could all give him a round of applause for his good work. And I think we still have more time for questions. Yeah, for sure. Hi, I'm Susan Crawford. I'm at Harvard University, actually at the law school, working on part of the pipeline, but I agree with you, Jane, that it has to be a very broad pipeline. Look, speaking of large economies, um, the shoreline counties of the United States are actually the third largest economy in the world behind China and 
the U.S. I'm wondering, in, it sounds like David has no responsibility for this, which, and you're probably lucky, but what about strategic withdrawal from the coast? We know that coastal real estate is overvalued to the tune of $200 billion. So, and New Jersey is right at the heart of this, and it's going to see three and four times the velocity of sea level rise change as the rest of the world. So what's the plan? Um, great question. I'm really glad that my chief resilience officer just walked into the room. <laughs> so Nick Angaron, why don't you take that question? What, what are we going to do? The state is also proposing new regulations to ensure that, you know, what is built is built in a in a manner that um, can uh, can kind of sustain itself through uh, through what's coming. Um, and we also have a a fairly successful um, buyout program for for flood impacted and and vulnerable communities. Um, it's certainly you know not no one of those answers is you know is the the one piece but kind of uh, bringing all of those together and trying to apply them um, uniformly um, and and where appropriately and working with the communities I think is uh, the best way we we've identified to move forward and I, I would add there I mean we're trying to break the cycle of you know disasters flooding and then rebuilding and it it is it is I'm always like the ghost of doom I guess on this panel um, I do believe the problems are solvable but I want to be realistic you know we're we have been in the process of um, doing rules on this and it is really tough because folks don't want to especially the developer community um, you know it's like regulation is you know a third rail even when it's you know it, it doesn't necessarily really impact a bottom line and it's trying to take a science-based approach to planning which is uh, just a hundred percent necessary hello um, great thank you all for all of your information this question's aimed towards my California friends I'm from Miami Florida I just moved to California I'm an undergrad at Pomona College and our, one of my lovely professors had us read a close reading of the California scoping plan recently. Very long document. Um, but I, it's very, very ambitious document, but it concedes a little bit in carbon utilization. And I kind of wanted to expand and ask you about that um, because it identifies in SB 995 how 15% of greenhouse gas emissions are expected to be taken from direct air capture and also in carbon capture and storage. And a little bit of that um, throughout the document shows how it would like relies on carbon utilization in for like heavy industries like steel, cement, et cetera. But a lot of environmental justice groups that I, when I looked into it really, really did not like this fact because they thought it prolonged fossil fuel infrastructure with blue hydrogen and natural gas. And so I wanted to ask how you explicitly create legislation that ensures well, because it's directly incorporated into like plan make plans and legislation already, how can you really explicitly make sure that this is not prolonging um, that industry? Yeah, so great question. Um, so we're actually funding $75 million for direct air carbon capture innovation, the first time we've done that this year. I think in general with the environmental justice community in California, carbon capture that's associated with fossil fuel generation is what's contested. The standalone carbon capture technologies, not so much. I mean, so if you look at Iceland, which has the largest standalone direct air carbon capture today in the world, um, you know, that, by the way, those facilities can get cited. They're very, carbon's fungible, you know, so you can take it out of the atmosphere in Iceland or California or anywhere in between. Um, and that, I think, generally is not so um, contested. And there are a bunch of different uh, chemistries to do that. Um, it's the sites, you know, at power plants or other fossil fuel extraction facilities where the fear is that somehow this makes it look green and then you can continue to burn fossil fuels. So that's that's where the debate is. I will tell you, I mean, I, uh, I do believe direct air standalone carbon capture 
has a pathway and there's momentum there. I recently did a tour of four or five of these companies in a row, a ton of innovation and cost reduction coming with that. And um, the one, uh, it's, I'm blanking on the name, it's out of Switzerland, but they've like signed contracts Climeworks. with Swiss, say again? Climeworks? Yeah, Climeworks, thank you, uh, with Swiss Air. So when you get on a Swiss airplane, they they uh, you know withdraw the amount of CO2 that, that was produced for that flight. Um, and in that case, what they're doing is actually remineralizing the CO2 into rock, which is a process that takes about a year to do, but I got to hold this rock, and it's sort of like the exact opposite of fracking in a way. Um, so that does have promise. We're investing in it. I think there's you know some private sector. You, are you invested in any of these? Um, yeah, what I'll say, I agree with everything David said. First of all, thank you for being involved in this issue. It's like makes me, warms my heart, and I see young people that are like dedicating their life to this. I'm on the Sunrise Movement Board. It's like a fashion of mine. Um, I... Uh, David's right on the standalone. The, the issue is even if you're capturing the carbon dioxide at the power plant, you're probably leaking other bad pollutants into black and brown communities uh, usually. So, But on the standalone direct air, air capture, what the scientists would say is we've already sent so much bad stuff up. We got to take some of it out. Even if we get to carbon neutral you know, by 2050, there's still a problem. So we're at some point, we're going to have to get some of this stuff out. And uh, what David's talking about, we see some exciting technologies on direct air capture. We're invested in some of these others, like they're crushing up rocks and sucking carbon out of the atmosphere and it goes into the soil where you can store it. Um, same thing with like biochar. You can have a device that goes along a tractor the ag waste gets kicked up, it creates through a chemical process, biochar, drops that in the soil, sucks carbon out of the atmosphere, you create a credit around that, people are starting to trade the credits. So that's some of the stuff that we're seeing. Oh, you can? I think that for the video they will. Go ahead, Ralph. Are you picking? Yeah. Okay. And then you next, yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, in terms of federal and in terms of states, um, I worked in, a, in a major infrastructure jobs for about 40 years around the world doing different uh, things and, and basically, but it boiled down to keeping track of how you're doing. Uh, what do you want to do and how are you doing? And, and in terms of federal, like right now we've got the Paris Agreement, it's like an old antique photo on the wall, you know, I don't know, nobody talks about it, nobody says, oh damn it, we missed our goal to get, you know, where we want to get. Um, federally and in the states, are you folks confident it's, I'm really impressed with all the stuff you're doing and, and setting goals, an agreement within your state and difficultly within, within the federal arrangement. Do you have clear goals and do folks know where they're at? If I'm watching the weather, I can see the rain and I can see the clouds, I can see the snow in California, and, and, but they don't talk about carbon. They don't talk about how's the air quality today in Miami. I think Miami's measuring uh, carbon really st strongly. I, I saw f f at least a little while back. It's not public, uh, you know, uh, really. But are you guys happy, and the lady's happy, on, on you know the goals, there's agreement within your state on what the goals are, lithium, where do you want to get to? It sounds like you're, you, you each individually, and federally, I don't know where we are with measuring climate because you got different states the coastals uh, Louisiana is different in Portland you know so do we need help do you guys need help and ladies need help with metrics just setting up here's the targets and yeah we hit it oh my god we can celebrate and we save this much money or we save that we our air quality went from this to this our water quality went from this to this um, uh, water rising is that you know it's not in the weather report <laughs> that's you know we only got six inches to go you know so I'm just asking what's what's your input on metrics and and are you where you want to be because if you don't have them I'm not sure you can get there you should talk to Davida because uh, she's doing this but I see incredible innovation around um, sensors satellite technology uh, that can give us the data that we need to do the measurements uh, that you're talking about. This is unlocking new things like insurance products that can be more predictive of where floods are gonna occur or if the flood happened. Um, 
there's going to be creative things with the U.S. government where, I don't know if you heard Ali last night, but he mentioned the U.S. Postal Service. And there's things that we can do by equipping them with sensors and whatnot that can do these data measurements. They're driving around all day in all of our neighborhoods. You can get hyper-local data you know, with that. So I think uh, there, people are interested in figuring out how do we create this baseline? Okay, where, are we, where have we been and where do we need to get and measure that along the way? And then we can take some political credit for this because we're not getting enough. You know, we're, we're doing everything we can to make people's lives healthier, happier, cheaper, you know, and it's only really one party, you know, at least at the federal level that's doing that. So um, we can maybe help us on the political side too. So huge agreement with your point. Metrics are great. We've done that, you know, for the electric sector, we had a 20% goal, beat that, 33% goal, beat that, 50% goal, beat that. Now we're headed to 100%. We're at 60% right now. Electric vehicles, you know, we had a one and a half million, million goal. We're about to beat that. We had a million solar roofs goal. We've beat that. And I think, you know, you, the story is you pass the goal, then you set the next goal. And um, people rally around that, actually. So um, I still think, you know, with our communications architecture, naturally, we, we, can, we can do better with this and have sort of national dashboard and so forth. But within state policy, those goals are very well known. And we hold utilities accountable. We hold the industry accountable. We hold ourselves accountable. And we need a lot more of that. I think it's, it's been essential. 